So I would like to welcome everyone to Low Connects. Um, are we there yet? A presentation by the De La Torre brothers. Um, I'm Jody Seifer. I'm the Curator of Education at the Low, and I'm very excited um, and honored to present tonight's speakers, Einar and Hemex De La Torre. Um, before I introduce them, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording um, this presentation and we will be posting it on the Lowe's YouTube channel afterwards. So please remember to keep your microphone on mute and please be aware that of what's going on in your background. We really appreciate it. Um, we are doing these presentations um, consciously in the meeting format and not the webinar format for this one, especially because we want to have this connection, this feeling of connecting and being able to do what we just did by saying hi to everyone. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, and please subscribe to the Lowe's YouTube channel. Um, so um, we welcome you though, even though your microphones are on mute to type into the chat along during the presentation, your questions for the brothers and um, we will be keeping track of them and I will try to get to as many as we can at the end. Um, that being said, we try to keep these presentations um, to an hour, of course, after the introduction. So please stay to the end to um, really get the whole experience. We may go slightly over. Just wanna say that ahead of time. Um, I would like to thank really quickly all the staff at the Low for their hard work on this program it really takes the entire staff. Uh, we would also like to thank take a moment to thank Mr. Sheldon Pally for his sponsorship of this Low Connects program. Um, we would also like to take a moment to honor Myrna Pally. Um, the Low mourns the loss of Myrna Pally, who together with her husband Sheldon helped to help the Low to emerge as a leader, a leading center for contemporary glass. Um, Mrs. Pally was a champion of Studio Glass and an enthusiastic supporter of INR and Hemex's work. I had the great privilege of hearing Mrs. Pally speak about their collection many times in my 13 years at the Low, and I will truly miss her presence there. Okay. Um, just another quick reminder um, to save the date for the next Low Connects, Allison Zuckerman Research and Practice. It'll be Friday, not a Thursday. December 4th at 5.30 p.m. Um, we will put this link in the chat, but it is on our website as well. And I just want to show this 18 second clip to promote it. These characters have been built through a procedure of self cannibalizing my own work and sampling and remixing art historical moments. So again, um, don't forget to sign on for that talk. It doesn't want to advance now. Not sure why. There we go. Um, and just at the end of the program, we really appreciate it if you would um, fill out the survey about the event. It helps the low in their future programming um, for our planning and also um, for grant purposes. So we will put the link to the survey in the chat feature if you want to grab it that way or check your email as well for that afterwards. Okay, so now finally, without further ado, I will um, introduce tonight's speakers. So I would really like to thank Einar and Hamex for giving this a virtual talk. Um, they spent a lot of time preparing for it and testing um, this virtual format with us, and we are very grateful. Um, they were born in Guadalajara, Mexico, um, and in a sudden family move, the brothers moved to the United States in 1972, going from a traditional Catholic school to a small California beach town. They both attended California State University at Long Beach, and Hamex got a BFA in sculpture in 83 and 
I now are decided against the utility of an art degree. The brothers currently live and work on both sides of the border, the Guadalupe Valley in Baja, California, Mexico, and San Diego, California, where I believe they are tonight. And the complexities of the immigrant experience and contradicting bicultural identities, as well as their current life and practice on both sides of the border inform their narrative and aesthetics. Their work is held in major public and private collections around the world, and they have had nearly 20 solo museum presentations, completed eight major public art projects, and participated in four international biennials. Among their numerous accolades are awards from the United States Artists, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, the Lewis Comfort Timpani Foundation, and the San Diego, San Diego Visual Arts Network. Please give a warm welcome to Einar and Hamex de la Torre. I'm going thank to stop so much, share. <laughs> thank you so much, Jody, and uh, thank you to all the uh, staff, Bridget and Christina, and of course, to, um, Many thanks to um, for putting this uh, whole thing together. I am going to share a screen now. And hopefully that'll work. And I'm going to press play. And does everybody see that? <laughs> hopefully. Um, so I, my brother, I, uh, Hamex, I'm Ainar de la Torre. Um, we, as Jody said, are from Guadalajara, Mexico. We moved to the United States in the early 70s. Um, this migratory experience, I think, informs our work greatly. Um, this is a, the United States is a land of immigrants, and I think that, that there's a lot of enrichment, rich, enrichment that can be found through all of these experiences. Um, so now um, we are working both in the um, United States and in Mexico and Baja California. And this is, well, where is it going forward? There we go, let's do that. This is an image of our new studio in Baja California near Ensenada. Uh, we just completed it, we just started working in it. Um, currently we're both uh, working both in Mexico and the United States, crossing the border weekly. And so when we build the studio, it's for mixed media uh, work. We do a lot of work with glass, but in this image, you can see how there's many things happening at the same time, including that panel in the middle, the triangle is for public art. We're doing a bit of a water jet cut uh, uh, aluminum and steel in our work as well. This is uh, some of our oldest uh, collaborative work from the early nineties on the left, uh, six foot high pyramid titled Baja Cali on the right, uh, also a six foot high sculpture titled Cuauhtémoc. So when we uh, titled the, um, the talk, are we there yet? You know, we get from students because we do a bit of teaching. We'll be in, teaching in Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina next summer. Uh, the one after that in Pilchuck, we were supposed to be there this summer, but COVID uh, delayed that. But, uh, and of course we go to universities such as the University of Miami and do work with students hands-on. But a lot of times students are wondering how you get there, so to speak. And one of the things we wanted to talk about is how that we don't really know because we're still working. <laughs> so I think it just takes a lot of work and you just keep going and you never, it's about getting there is my point. Uh, and the whole idea that you've arrived is uh, ephemeral. We're schlepping our work uh, as much as ever. Um, and that's part of the, you know, part of the glamour is not just the openings. It's, it's all of the, you know, packing stuff and getting things ready and, um, anyway, this is older work um, doing with mixed media, like that barbecue on the right side piece called Temuk is um, life size, and that's a gas tank of a motorcycle, um, that's Evil Knievel Vest, for those of you old enough to remember him. A couple of more recent sculptures on the left, uh, Bible Belt, and on the right, Miklantekuli. Uh, the one on the left is about two and a half feet high, the one on the right is about three and a half feet high, the one on the left is uh, a uh, resin base with a uh, long glass sculpture, and the one on the right is uh, ceramics with long glass. And in long glass, we're very interested in maintaining a freshness, uh, a spontaneity, sort of like a watercolor. We wanted to, we want the hot glass to, to be in the sculpture itself. So in one in, in one way, we don't want the glass technique to completely control that feeling of molten glass. If you know, if you can understand what I'm saying. Yeah, so it's so really one of the big, uh, big um, uh, 
influences for us was the, the expressionism. And I think that we're really interested in, in the expression, the free flow of expression. Uh, it is more about getting um, getting to the desired uh, uh, cons or idea or emotion than than the, in the, in, in what technique can help us get there. Um, the piece on the left is sort of it's a very tall piece done in Raticello, uh, done with the crew of the Tacoma Museum of Glass, the best crew we've ever worked with. Uh, and Radicello is a very complicated Italian technique of weaving the cane and the baskets. That is mounted on a car rim, so it gives you a little bit of an idea of the size. That's a regular um, rim for a standard uh, sedan. And the one on the right uh, has a terracotta base that we did in a residency with, um, um, with, with in Seattle, a ceramic residency with the uh, um, Pottery Northwest. Two more glass sculptures. The one on the left is the Lord of the Flies. The one on the right, uh, El Astronauta. And so to use um, uh, um, found objects, we kind of object to the idea of found objects. We really go out of our way to find certain things that speak to us. Uh, we prefer the sort of anthropological angle of, of uh, material culture. When um, objects represent a culture through their material uh, you know, of uh, content, they, they, they are imbued in a way with, what, with the power by that uh, contemporary culture. So for instance, on the El Astronauta, which by the way, is sort of like, um, he, like being an astronaut of going into the inner mind because he's very high on drugs, on psychedelics. Um, he's, he's holding the binoculars he's holding are an Avon bottle, back when Avon had all of these wild little decanters and shapes. On the left, uh, sculpture of a Lucha Libre wrestler guy that had just basically made a human sacrifice. And on the right, is a, it's a little devil. Devils, it turns out devils are hugely popular. Who knew? And the title of this one is 2020, sort of like when a new year comes in as a baby and the old year comes out, comes out as an old man is that uh, in the beginning of 2020, we just did not guess what a momentous year this was gonna become. So we thought of him as sort of a little Aztec emperor who, who's about to um, change things greatly. Um, and he's got the channel changer and his uh, little control remote in his hand. And uh, he's on a bed of roses. Um, that, those, that bed is made out of um, uh, polyester resin uh, we use it a lot in our work because you can put inclusions into them, unlike glass that is very limited with inclusions in terms of um, coefficients of expansion, meaning it has to get very hot and shrink to a cold temperature at the same rate. Um, the, the, the polyester resin allows us to put things in it and use it like glass for its transparency, but uh, have a, all the content still inside. Here's a picture of both of us working at the uh, Pilchuck Glass School, north of Seattle. Uh, we have a long history in that school in the early 80s. Uh, we went there as students, as TAs, and now we've been going there as teachers. So this year we're supposed to go there, but uh, uh, classes were canceled because of COVID. Hopefully we'll go back in two years, next year to Penland. And I think that maybe we've taught there about six times up till now, six uh, different summers. It's it's wonderful because it's an intensive. Um, um, you're when you're in these uh, summer courses, you are um, you're basically being fed there so and have a place to stay so you really focus on making work and exchanging ideas with other artists and even other classes that are happening simultaneously. The piece on the left is called The Curator's Eye. Uh, we made him in, uh, um, in um, Netherlands. Uh, we're joking with the curator about what is the curator's eye and what is, what, what is um, you know, the good taste, bad taste, and all of these other constructs, which of course are moving constantly as, as um, time goes by and, and certain fashion, things go in and out of fashion. Um, and the one on the right is, um, and they're both relatively large figures, about uh, two and a half feet high. The, the, the figure on the, I mean, the animal on the right is a series of animals that we like to think of as a sort of a, a animal, um, an animal spirit or tonali in the, in the, in the Nahua Aztec uh, tradition, which is uh, kind of like the animal of your, of your, that's linked to your existence. The title for the one on the right is The Recurring Dream. And that, that creature is still tied to the underworld with this chain 
that goes inside the resin base below. And that's also a, a reference to the way that the, uh, the Aztecs saw the, um, the world and the underworld. To them, it was uh, the sun is kind of like a, uh, the evening is a reflection of the morning uh, on obsidian. So there's a wonderful idea of the world and the netherworld and reality versus uh, the reflection of reality. The one on the left is an homage to Prince. We just happened to be in Minneapolis when he died. So we made a memorial piece to him. It's Princess Tonali. Um, and, uh, and as you see, both of these little animal figures have also uh, resin bases that have a lot of content inside of them. Again, the material, material culture content. Uh, the one on the left is a, a, a large bottle of part of a series that we'll call or drunk bottles. Very, very, very large piece also done in the Kuma Museum of Glass. And lastly, the, a, a, little, um, a little scorpion ballerina is the, um, the, the end of the, of, the, of the little animal series. So these two are, are um, what, uh, what we like to sometimes talk about are extra credit pieces, meaning these are pieces that we do that are a little bit of outside of our you know, glass and mixed media production. These are all made with found, uh, or again, material culture objects that we've made. There's some resin, ca cast resin pieces that we fabricate, but it's mostly things that we are finding here and there and, and searching. And we gather a lot of material culture objects in, um, in uh, swap meets or, uh, or um, uh, just different stores. Anyone in our travels, uh, we gather a lot of material and we sort of put these pieces together. And they also allow us to make some work that is on a, on a price point that's a little more accessible uh, than some of our other work. Uh, Botanica, verdad? Yeah, this is Botanica. This is the piece that's in the, um, in the uh, museum, the Low Museum, um, that the, the was purchased by the Ali. Shout out to uh, Sheldon. Um, and it, it is uh, from, I think, 14. Uh, we were still, uh, you know, we're, we've been doing the lenticulars now for 10 years. Um, uh, and that this one has a blown glass figure in front with a peyote hat. Um, and he's sort of showing us the way. The background image in the lenticular is an image taken at the, um, at the Museum of uh, Natural History in New York City. This is back in our studio in Mexico. We we're both figuring out how to merge glass blowing with lenticular prints. Uh, in this case, we're using a glass blown uh, virgin uh, piece that we make. Uh, it's, it's as part of a series that we've been making for years in installations and pieces. It's basically the portal of life for the Virgin of Guadalupe without the Virgin Humanas. And on the right, you will see right now, I'm going to click and it's going to move and you will see what the lenticular effect is if you pay attention to the right side. So when we get a lenticular panel, this is a lenticular panel after we, we got it from the printers. Here we have stuck a light panel behind it, an LED light panel, and we're playing in our studio with objects that may or may not go as we're figuring out the arrangements we want to make. And this is the finished piece. Um, it's right now at the Copeland Del Rio Gallery in Seattle. It is called White Privilege. And you can see how the lenticular image it has, uh, has a, a back in the middle, is backlit with an LED panel. The whole frame is made out of um, water jet cut aluminum, which leaves us wonderful um, sort of uh, little shadows in the background. And then there's three dimensional resin cast objects in front of it. So there's a lot of uh, dimension happening aside from the perceived dimension in the lenticulars themselves. Miss Maito, a uh, larger piece. This is about five feet wide by three and a half feet high. high. And this was done a uh, project we were invited to do um, work with a scientist, a show of artists working with scientists from the Salk Institute. Um, and we were working with a scientist that specializes in mitochondria research. So to give you an idea how this made, here's a detail of when we were, we were pouring the resin over the, the frame in our studio. This is, these are the water jet cut out aluminum with some inclusions of glass beads and um, some epoxy coating on top. And here I'm going to talk a little bit about lenticular. So in, in these lenticular panels, they are um, there's two images, and um, when in the way that they work is they have a lens on top of the image that does parallax blocker, meaning you will see one image, and as you move from left to right, you would see the other image. So and then it would be back back to the to the to the original one. Um, 
So it'd be that one, and then you would move and see that one. So they would jump. Um, and again, it's because of the lens in front of it that allows you to see one image or the other. So there's a lot of movement happening when people are viewing these images. So the title means mito is short for mitochondria, which was the, the theme that we explore with the scientist. This is another, um, another lenticular panel. And as you can see, the image of the lenticular is a little blurry because it takes um, a video to show the movement. I will show you that as well. But to give you an idea, this is when the water jet could frame, but the piece in the middle of the lenticular is this image. And then as you move, you would see this image. So you would be jumping between these two. So for instance, uh, uh, this is a very large piece about seven, almost seven feet tall, five feet wide, um, called Feminencia. Um, and the image, um, you can see the image uh, uh, movement on the, on the image on the right. I'm gonna click it and you will see it as the camera moves along in front. So experientially, that's what happens as you move around in, in, in the gallery. And these are the two images uh, that you were seeing inside that, uh, the flat files, as I call them, meaning all of the layers from the Photoshop are flattened so you could see them more clearly on a computer screen. The two images only coincide in the eyes of the middle figure. There, they stay the same and everything else changes in this, big, in this image. Uh, this is an installation titled Soy Beaner. It was the final uh, stage of a piece that we started in Porto Alegre, Brazil, in the Biennale. Uh, basically, we wanted to make an Aztec calendar piece with elements uh, basically from Chinese imports in Brazil and Mexico. Dollar store. Our idea is to use uh, cultural elements that were interpreted in China. And in this case, uh, the title soy beaner has the double entendre of uh, I am a beaner, or it's a beaner made out of soy beans, as you can see in the little faces resin faces that are made out of soybeans. And so when we do installations like these, uh, these are glass box fabrication, very much in like Thurman Statham style of making glass boxes and putting content inside. You can see how old these are because those televisions have a VCR built in. Uh, so this is some of our older installation work. Now, mind you, installation work for us is, um, is probably some of the most the most freedom we can have is that uh, we have we like to say that we have three prong three sort of three prongs to our career. We do we do gallery work, um, installation work such as these, and then public art. They all have slightly or or even very different um, uh, end results, but they are they are after all all part encompass in our career very much. This uh, this these two centuries were part of a production that we made in. A with, with a residency in Grand Arts in Kansas City. And it was a momentous time for our careers because we were able to develop a set of, uh, we were able to develop a language in the installation art through uh, the generosity of uh, this grant. Uh, we produced uh, four major pieces. These pieces are almost 10 feet high. Which included video, which we did never worked with, uh, kinetic work and so on. Um, this piece we made for an exhibition at, uh, at the USC Museum, the Fisher uh, Museum in, in Los Angeles. It is life-size, meaning that that figure is more or less human size. There's a lunar lander using the Olmec head. Um, and uh, we were, were really intrigued by how the Olmecs uh, had, made, had made these gigantic basalt heads that are very much, they're cut right below the neck, which is not at all a Western aesthetic. And they were, they seemed to us that they were very much like a, like a, like a, um, uh, it, it, it divorced it from being a, a bust, and therefore it was a lot more of uh, the sort of uh, uh, um, the, the eyes move around so the uh, in the video so that we really wanted to animate these. And here's another version of the same the same face. This one with human hair. Title is maybe we collaborated with a, a poet and word artist uh, Quincy Troop, and he basically did a monologue that we filmed basically with his mouth cut out, seen from a cut up in paper, as you can see in the eyeballs of the piece. So basically the piece itself is a, is a carved out travel trailer with an installation inside. Uh, the face itself is a, sorry. 
it's made out of resin and human hair, so it has a strange quality to it. And in this this particular um, uh, show was at the the Heard Museum in um, in uh, Phoenix, so it was interesting that this exhibition of the Holy Dan Diaspora in the Desert was in the American Indian Museum that also did for a while contemporary art exhibitions. This is our first lenticular ever. We, we had this uh, um, show in, in Macla in San Jose, California, and uh, we ran into lenticular for the first time and decided to, to uh, move the direction of our project to this. This is a, a triptych by um, um, Hans Memling, that is uh, the sort of a judgment, the last judgment, that we uh, change the characters to include the sort of like the conquest, meaning that the, Ameri the Indians in the Americas felt that it was the last judgment uh, the, when, when the invasion happened from the Europeans. So the Archangel judging in the middle has uh, Cortez's face and Christ above has uh, Quetzalcoatl's uh, face. So um, I'm going to show some, uh, we have a tour that, um, an, an exhibition that's touring in Europe. Um, this is in um, 2013 in Lomo. And these are butterflies are lenticular. They wink at you as you walk by them, the crucifix butterflies. This is an installation of 300 of these in the tower in the museum in Lomo. Um, it's about a five story high, six story high tower. And this is the bottom of the tower. And we had an exhibition of work, largely um, all the work made in, uh, in, in Europe, um, but there and, and even in uh, S12 in, in, in Bergen and in, uh, Norway. Um, and only, we only imported a very few pieces. Uh, mostly it was made there. So this exhibition then went to the National Glass Center in England, in Sutherland. So this is, this is that exhibition in Sutherland. So we use a lot of photo murals for our, for our um, installations because they're a really good way to create a new space. Uh, we've been, uh, these are images that we've also even made in lenticular. Um, and uh, so our work sort of feeds upon other work. In this case, this image is the, um, the border between the United States and Mexico in Tijuana. And that's the border going into the Pacific Ocean. Except that here we populated um, images from um, the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. This is a piece that we initially made in, uh, in, uh, Toulouse. in, in, in Toulouse in France uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and it has, it, we used it again in a couple of exhibitions. In, this, the, the, in the case of this one, it's in England, in Sutherland, in the Glass Museum there. It was part of the same exhibition. And we used those same butterflies um, in a different installation. This piece is kinetic in that it, uh, you could spin it. And it's a, on, it, on its axis. So we'll go around. Then that exhibition that later went to the National Glass Museum in the Netherlands in Leerdam. Uh, we did a new photo murals. Um, and with our photo murals, we, we, we include ourselves in them sometimes. So this image is, I may have me or my brother's faces. The, the curator is represented in this one as well. And we're having fun with some of the European classicism mixed with, uh, with a, um, uh, sort of the, the, the new world, the image of the romanticized image of the Aztec in the middle. Um, I think a lot of our work does that mixes the, the so in an anachronological fashion, mixes some of the old and the new. So here we have the same wallpaper, but we used it on the floor in that gallery as well on the left side. And you could see how that uh, museum has these vitrines and sort of a home to, uh, that was turned into a museum. Uh, and the image on the right is a big wall uh, mural. Again, we try to include three-dimensional objects so that your eye gets fooled to the two-dimensionality of the, of the background and then have these pieces pop out. Um, in this case, there's a blown glass piece in the middle and those um, little animals going our way are, around are dummies for taxidermists. I think they're probably um, little squirrels. And there's a bottle, a, a jar at the bottom uh, also, that's made out of glass sticking out of a shelf. Then we went to Denmark and did an exhibition uh, titled Sloth because we got uh, the we got the privilege of exploring the theme of sloth in uh, in Denmark. Uh, seven museums took the seven the, the seven deadly sins, and uh, in the glass museum we we created new work, including some large scale and lenticulars. So on the left side, you can see the uh, the sleeping Mexicans ascending without doing anything. That was the theme of our 
exhibition is that uh, you can progress by doing nothing. So uh, for us, it was very special to go to Denmark because of my mother's father, my grandfather, uh, our grandfather was from Denmark. So there was a really strange uh, feeling that how, what, is, uh, what is in us that is Danish, our aesthetic certainly isn't minimalist. Um, we do consider ourselves maximalists, uh, if anything. So the piece on the left is a large lenticular that they commissioned one of uh, two large lenticulars. And that piece in the, the very middle of it is a lenticular. And then the piece on the right is a, a GIF file that shows how the printer says it, sends us the files when they're getting them ready to print. So this is the movement that you would see as you walk across. And that kind of movement, things appear, things disappear. That's what happens as you walk across this piece that's on the left side. The background, of course, in the, in the image on the left is a photo mural. Then we were part of an exhibition in Holland in a fort, basically taking uh, glass designers and, and, and glass artists collaborating uh, called Glass Cities uh, uh, from several cities in, in, in Europe. And this is, uh, just to give you an idea, this is 2017 and so was the show in Denmark. Both of these shows in Europe were in 2017. So we had two rooms in this fort and we made it, uh, this big sort of decadent dinner uh, all in, the, in the other room we had, the other one had the bottles. So in this room, we made this very, very decadent, opulent dinner, sort of a, a dinner of excess. It's a sort of like a post-capitalism uh, installation. And then uh, that exhibition, a uh, new version of it anyway, went to uh, the Fraunau Museum in 2018. And Fraunau is in Bavaria and we need a new, new mural. So these photo murals are super busy, but there's a lot of three-dimensional objects jutting out. Um, we don't have time to focus on all the details, but th there's blown glass pieces and resin pieces poking out of the wall on this and a lot of content between the uh, sort of European classical paintings and some uh, contemporary images from Mexico. This is the other um, installation we did in Fraunau, this sort of corner space. And in the middle of it, we uh, had our atelier, something we've been doing since, since the show in, in, in Netherlands is uh, having a pedestal with some of the leftover pieces, bo bottles of beer we might have been drinking to do the installations, uh, glue, uh, pieces that we didn't quite use in the work, just to give a little feel of what our studio is like. It has been quite popular. People really have remarked how um, they're intrigued by, it. they always wonder, you know, what it looks like and how it feels. And it gives a little feeling of that kind of the mayhem that we somehow have to uh, make order out of in our, in our studio. And last year we went to Lille where we were asked to uh, do an exhibition, an installation on the theme of uh, El Dorado. And, and we continue our exploration on, of, of a table that uh, symbolizes full decadence of post-capitalism again. So in, so in the city of Lille in Northern France, they do a exhibition, they do a gigantic festival every three years or so. Uh, and this year the El Dorado was a kind of Latin American theme. They had uh, a gigantic museum exhibitions with blue chip artists. They had giant uh, the, uh, parades and parties and all kinds of stuff happens. So the whole city gets turned into a, a gigantic kind of arts, arts festival. It was a great experience. This is a different angle on the same uh, on the same installation. And then in this exhibition, we also showed the pieces from uh, the, the glass fort in the Netherlands, which are on display cases, these large bottles and chalices we made. And last year also, we also went to, to Poland and uh, we created an installation in the, uh, in the end of the gallery, a big photo mural basically symbolizing uh, with uh, images of different uh, paintings in, uh, in battles in, in Poland, the many battles in Poland. And in the middle, we have a Slavic um, creature called the Volyanov. Uh, he's an old man with a frog face that basically takes people or saves people in the pond. But we took him as a symbol, sort of like uh, this Greta Thunberg of uh, reminding us that, the, sort of like uh, the Lorax, reminding us that the uh, that uh, the things can go on forever. So a lot of these installations have, we do a lot of research when we have thematics. And in this case, we looked into the, um, the Northern um, um, Crusades and how the, the, when the Southern Crusades were lost, they went to the North to uh, base, basically kick the pagans out of the woods and make them sort of civilize them, so to speak, which of course it took humans that were living in harmony with, uh, with the, in the forests um, into, into villages. 
so we're really intrigued by that whole idea and, and how maybe the future of humanity is linked to maybe um, dealing with nature in a, in a much more rational way. This is the same exhibition. This is in Breslau in, uh, in uh, Poland. The gallery is the SIC gallery. Wonderful place, great curator. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, it. So about one year, a year ago from now. The other wall we used an image that we used in Lille that had, uh, that had a European wall. And we wanted to talk about uh, how the issues of uh, migration that are so polarizing in the, in the United States and of course, us as Mexicans in Europe, they have the same thing. And the, the big wall there is the Mediterranean and how Turkey is holding, you know, Syrians and uh, threatening uh, Europe with letting more go to Europe and all of this political football that uh, that migration can become. And another remake of the, the, the decadent table, the, the museum in Poland had uh, a basement. So we made two, two uh, installations down there. Now we're going to show quickly some public art that we're doing because that also keeps us quite busy. This is a 16-foot uh, robot, kind of a post-World War II Japanese uh, tin robots uh, that we grew up with. It is um, This was done in steel and uh, the pink stuff is hand-carved cantera stone. Uh, this is in San Diego. And this is a lenticular installation 10 feet high in uh, Rancho Los Amigos uh, Hospital in, uh, in Downey, California. It seems to bubble out, but it doesn't bubble out. That piece is actually flat. This is just the optical illusion. And this is the proof that they sent us from the from the printer. So you get an idea how we're getting these. They're relatively low res, but you get an idea of, of the, the tremendous amount of depth. So this piece, uh, the, the big public art pieces, they have a, um, the lenticulars can have a depth of up to 20 perceived inches, even though they are technically flat. It's a flat print. It is the, the, the lens in front of it that like fools your eye into perceiving depth and of course the movement from one image to another. So in the, in the same hospital that the last piece is in, in Los Angeles, um, there is, the, we made this piece at a waiting room. It's about three to three by five feet and it's got a lenticular background and some blown glass fish. So here we're combining the blown glass with the lenticular again. It's only about five inches, six inches deep, but within there we floated the fish on plexiglass so they look like they're swimming inside of this lenticular background. And this is or the largest lenticular piece we have done. It's 22 feet high uh, by almost eight feet wide and in, in a niche in the wall. And so you see on the left, I'm going to turn the video on on the left, you see the proportion with a human being down below and how the thing moves as you walk by. And now I'm going to click the video on the right. That's the GIF image that the printer sent us. So it goes from one image completely to another. This is the biggest lenticular we've made. And right now we have commissions for another hospital and also a large lenticular for the Cheech Center in uh, Riverside. I have to say, it still surprises me that they let us put our stuff in their buildings. <laughs> In the same hospital, we made a 21 uh, foot tall um, hand carved cantera stone tree um, with the, the stone is carved in Tecate, um, Baja California, Mexico from a model that we made. And uh, they, they basically reproduce our model, which might be four feet tall and then reproduce it on large cantera stone, again, hand carved. It's obviously a tree of life, but it's, 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 it has the spinal column in the middle too with the tendrils coming up because that is what they treat their spinal injury. Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Center in Downey, California. And um, in 2018, uh, we finished this project at a library in San Isidro, California. Uh, these are um, steel screens, water jet cut. Um, so uh, the screens we wanted to make uh, to have the look and feel of papel picado, which is the, the in Mexico for festivities, they, uh, they, they show these banners that unfold of tissue paper, colored tissue. Uh, they're they, they call papel picado because they're actually done with a chisel because it's, it's a ream of paper that is chiseled out uh, little pieces and then an image comes up as you unfold it. So we wanted to sort of talk about that tradition in the look and feel, especially the edges of it. And here's a, um, another one. Uh, a little better contrast on this in terms of color. Again, this is uh, the other one was uh, uh, 13 by 23 feet. This one's about 15 by 15 feet uh, up, up above the, um, the, 
In the same library, additionally, we have a, a gateway inside with uh, columns with lenticular prints and a can car can cantera stone on the top. And so the, the, the columns that are lenticular, to give you an idea, this is a bunch of lenticular work. So um, I'm going to click the one on the right first. Um, that one, you can see the movement and depth. And that same one switches to this next image as you move along. So even though you're seeing all that depth, at one point it turns into the other image. Now I'll do the one to the left, all the way to the left. And that one switches to the one that's in the middle there. So that's happening as you're walking by this column. This is a Polycart uh, project that uh, we just uh, finished and we're about to install probably in February. Uh, it's a set of uh, parasols, uh, uh, 14 and 12 feet wide. So this is um, aluminum that's been water jet cut. Those circles that are uh, that you see in both parasols are going to have these um, uh, hand uh, polished uh, glass jewels, and they will refract the light because these are outdoors, and it will that light will be hitting the ground. Um, so to give you an idea of scale, uh, here we're just testing the light that they will have at night. Uh, they're going to be two 16 footers, uh, 16 foot diameter, and 16 foot tall. Um, and um, and uh, the, the, at night it will be lit, as you see in this image. Here's a sort of an artistic uh, rendition of it. Underneath that, that freeway is the 105 freeway in LA. So it's a it's a light rail station that is a a, um, a junction of two different lines in the, in a, of a, of the metro in LA. And um, that rocket on the right is uh, one of the first stages in a new piece we're making for the city of Sacramento. It will be 30 feet tall and also project light of flowers all over the wall. And that is going to conclude the presentation part. I think we are to take questions. As you can see to the left, there's our, our webpage and our representation called Blend Del Rio Gallery in Seattle. And uh, um, the European tour will go on to the Glass Museum in Marina Grande, Portugal. It was supposed to be in May of this year, but it got delayed because of COVID to May of next year. And the Smithsonian Latino Center chose us for their first exhibition uh, ever. They're a relatively new entity. Uh, that will open October 21st at the Cheech Museum, which will also be their, their first exhibition, the debut show, uh, October of 2021 in Riverside, California will travel to other museums and so on. So with that, having said all of that, um, it's time for questions. Thank you so much, Einar and Hemex. Um, that was really fantastic. And um, everyone's just saying what brilliant, beautiful, amazing in the comments. And there were quite a few questions. So I'm going to try to get to everyone's. They're a bit meaty. I'm going to stop um, sharing. OK, great. Okay, so, you, so you're on, and I'm going to look at the chat. When we're on, I couldn't see the chat well because we were. Um... Yeah, I spotlighted you. Um, so that's okay. fine. I got all the questions, so I can read them for you and for everyone. Um, but Jenna wants to know um, you use such a wide variety of material. Um, can you talk about how you make your material, your object, and your imagery decisions? And what are some of your intentions with their juxtaposition and their contextual presentation? Um, we'll, we've always been about including everything. Uh, Anti-minimalist, you might say, Baroque artist. Uh, and in that process, I guess, uh, it, it's, it's, it, to answer that question is kind of hard because how, how do we make those decisions with materials? Usually we start with an idea and we start with the material and then it gets complicated. And then we sort it all out and, and edit it and we take stuff out. Uh, and maybe I, I might add that um, part of the reason we, we are so additive in our process is not just because we collaborate, but um, being born in Mexico and being feeling Mexican, coming to the United States and becoming American and feeling American. Then there is a Chicano, which is a separate identity within the United States. I think we early learned on that, um, that more was better, uh, that yes, we can be this and we can be that. And we learned that being self-defined is to be self-limited. So if somebody says to us, You're, are you glass artists? We say, yes, then we are also other things. It's, it's sort of a yes and yes build. And I think that that speaks to materials as well. Uh, we see materiality in the same way. I mean, we don't, um, you know, the, 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 
the preciousness of glass, uh, we've always fought it because we're, after all, glass is not precious and we throw it out. We, we drink a bottle of something and throw the bottle out. Glass isn't intrinsic. It's what you do with it that matters. So we have always felt that that's what you need to show is what you can are able to do with it in terms of your, your manipulation and, 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 uh, and your craft skills. Great, thank you. And so, so sort of following up on that question, um, a bunch of people wanted to know sort of how are you sort of self-taught and you mentioned that you teach at um, Pilchuck and Penland, you know, are, did you have to teach yourself how to do a lot of the things that you want to accomplish to create these amazing works that you showed us? Well, I think uh, instrumental in, in us uh, starting an art career is having a mentorship. Uh, uh, we, we spent a lot of time with our close friend and brother, Thurman Statham. And we learn from him. We learn from his studio how to how to uh, proceed with an art career, how to push uh, galleries and uh, collectors, and and the compromises that uh, one has to do to maintain a studio. It, in some ways, we learned there more than we did in uh, in art school. Art school was important too, but uh, the actual reality is the piece that is missing in an art education. Well, we all we all need to be exposed to that sort of like an internship. internship. And I think also in terms of um, of schooling, I mean, I went to art school. I just didn't go through the through, through the full graduation, but I went to the same university for years. Um, I think you learn a lot what you don't want to do. Um, you know, you're trying things out, and that's not for me. And but if all of that stuff, uh, like all learning, gives you more repertoire to to pull from, because sometimes techniques have details that may work for you in, in the future, whether it's directly related to the use of that technique or not. Learning is learning, and it's all additive and wonderful and positive. I mean, I we 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 thoroughly believe in in the in in education. Um, not we're not. I don't think we are necessarily self-taught any more or less than anybody else. We certainly can call ourselves outsiders, outsider artists, because we did go to school and we did do the the learning in that way. Yes, and certainly all the your knowledge um, and all the art historical references you're putting into your works. Um, and on sort of that question, there were quite a few questions about your influences, um, wanting to know if you were influenced by Vassarelli, Dali, and you mentioned Bosch, but people had the question, um, but sort of who else you were influenced. And, and also, um, similar to that, is how much research you typically do for each piece. We were, we were always great fans of the German expressionists, but uh, of course, Goya and the Mexican muralist are in our work too. Uh, and uh, in, in Glass, again, Thurman Stadium was instrumental in, uh, in uh, helping us develop a language in installation art. And Erwin Eich, I think in terms of expressionism, I think he was very expressionistic way back in, in his, the way that he made glass work. Uh, lots of respect for Erwin as well. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of places that we're pulling from. And as far as the research part, I think it depends greatly. Sometimes if we're doing a thematical, um, you know, like when we've gone to Europe and they asked us to work with a Flemish and when we were in, uh, in Belgium, uh, then we all of a sudden went, well, you know, we love the primitives. Um, in fact, we called the exhibition in Belgium uh, the New World Primitives because uh, we wanted to cross back I mean, Mexicans are, are largely a, a mestizos, meaning that they're a mixture of European and indigenous. So I think that it is, it's natural for us to look at the mixture of things as a positive, um, because our work isn't about distilling and getting this sort of uh, a distillation process. It is about layering. Um, we very often refer to our, our work as a, sort of like an onion that has many layers. And we don't mind if somebody doesn't go down a certain path or a certain layer, because after all, what people make out of it sometimes is, um, we like to say that, you, that artists make work to, to find out and then they exhibit the work they make to find out what, about what they made. So other people tell you about what you made. And that is a much more enriching way to look at the process of making art than to um, sort of say, I made this and you either get it or don't get it. Um, I'd rather have uh, the public teach me about what, what, what we made. I think a lot of uh, the ideals of uh, modern and contem more contemporary art are about distilling ideas to the bare bone, sometimes even excluding aesthetics. And uh, we have always thought that, we've always thought that uh, 
it was important to include everything that uh, moves us aesthetically and not uh, necessarily distill things to a bone, but be more inclusive. And to us, that's a more realistic representation of uh, uh, reality and human condition, the messiness, the perpetual grayness, and the, also the connectivity in, in uh, unexpected ways. I love that, um, especially coming from education, you know, that is something that we try to tell all of our visitors in person and virtually that, you know, you make your own meeting of the work of art. So that's great. Um, so a lot of people are also wondering how you work together and what that process is like. Um, how do you um, collaborate? Do you work on each piece together? Do you each do a part? What's that like? The, col the collaboration is like an ongoing conversation. So it's not exactly about the uh, uh, adversarial. And in some ways, uh, it, we do argue, but it's not, uh, uh, it's about who persists more with a certain idea. And it's pretty free flowing because we have done it so long and because also we were interested in, in the same themes and the same aesthetics. And I think it works really well within us because uh, I tend to be more of a sculptor. Einar tends to be more of a two-dimensional artist. So that, that, you know, the, the two things come together in a lot of the pieces. Yeah, and I, and I think that um, um, in in we do have specialities a little bit, especially in public art, because we can't both do everything. But when we're blowing glass, I mean, it's hard to say that you know I did this little dot or he made that other part. We really try to. It's kind of seamless. It's whoever is sitting down is taking the bits to make the the sculpture, and the other person is standing up is organizing the people bringing those parts. So there is a, a really, really blurry lines as far as that's concerned. But I think we learned early on that our work, we uh, get, got better when we collaborated, meaning that in the 90s, a typical exhibition would be a third her is a third mine. And maybe we started collaborating in the 90s. By 2000, we were doing just collaborative work. Um, we just noticed how the layering kept happening more and more. And, of, um, and we, we promote collaboration because artists can get stuck in their own sort of ruts and it's a really good way to confront something you wouldn't yourself put in front of you. I think uh, in, in collaboration, the wonderful thing is that you remove yourself from the anxiety of full responsibility. And that gives you this strange freeing uh, license to try stuff and to, and to deep secretly say, yeah, it has its own life because I am I'm not 100%, I'm only 50% responsible for that. <laughs> So we blame each other a, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But collaboration is important and you guys seem like you work so well together. And you mentioned in, a, not in this presentation, but in some of our practices, how you had, and you, of course you mentioned Thurman, who we love and shout out to Thurman, but you mentioned how um, your wives will often help with ideas and things like that as well. So other yeah, people uh, in your life. Yeah, Havix's uh, wife is a um, um, ceramicist and has quite a career going um, in that field as well. And, uh, and my fiance is uh, um, the, an artist and is as of late curating as well. So yes, there's, it's in the family. Great, and so a lot of people, of course, you s explained it a bit, but um, as expected, people really want to know um, more about the lenticular process, if you could elaborate again, I guess. Well, I, I, I could, um, one thing that the lenticular has an old history, but it, the analog old history, this is, I remember when I was a kid, um, what it is, they used to call them wikis, I think, uh, used to be on lunch pails and all that stuff. What it is, is that you're taking an image and uh, cutting it into very thin lines, and you're extricating half the material, and you're, and you're introducing another image in lines. Could be a similar one with a small change, or an entirely different one. And in front of that, you put this lens, which has little lines in it, uh, that worked like little prisms and which acts as a parallax blocker, meaning that parallelly speaking, you're blocking one image and then you see the other. So as you move, you will see one image or the other. This is very simple. You, I think they even sell uh, basic little uh, kits that you can do this at home with a home printer. Um, what you can do nowadays with the computers though, is that um, for instance, some of the big images, when I send out to get printed are, um, there could be two or three gigabytes in size they're ginormous images because they have all of the um, all of the layers. You don't discard 
what's behind because part of making depth, so depth perception happens in two ways. One is with stereo vision, uh, which is relatively short term. And the other one is with uh, um, the, the way that objects move in space as you move. Uh, again, for th things that are farther away are, are smaller, near, and if something blocks an image and then you can see something behind, um, then our mind immediately creates a space. So what, uh, the, what, they, what you can do with a lenticular lens is um, make an object look like it's, it's coming, uh, it's being revealed as you move from behind. And this gives you the complete feeling that there's depth. Uh, the bigger pieces have uh, 20 inches of perceived depth. In, and interestingly enough, they have about five or six um, inches in front of it. So sometimes you go up to the, and, and, try, and you can, it looks like you're gonna grab an image that's coming out of the piece. Um, and you can like stick your finger into the, into the, um, the, um, the actual lenticular image. Uh, I hope that helps explain a little bit. I think it did. Thank you so much for do, going into that detail. And we're going to be a little selfish here. We have a, a quite a few of our volunteer guides on the call, and they really want to know more about the Botanica piece donated by the Pallies. Um, I know you mentioned the background was taken at the um, Museum of Natural History, but we want to know more about, you know, we make our own meaning, of course, but more about what what if you remember from 2014 what you were thinking about why you named it botanica and any of that any detail as, as Einar mentioned the, the image in the back uh, is a montage from different photographs he took in the natural history museum in uh, nova york nova york and uh, and to us it's uh, those those type of naturalistic collections have always fascinated us you know we we grew up with national geographic we grew up always being fascinated by uh, the strangest in nature. And I think that's an homage to that. Uh, the little guy in the middle has a hat that's basically a peyote. So basically he's hypersensitive to appreciating na nature. So he's, he's, he's sort of like a shaman promoting the, the, the wonders of, of nature, you might say. So that, that, that's the angle he's sort of, and that's why he's pointing back to, to, to the image from the museum, kind of uh, bringing you in or uh, having you come in to and join him in his uh, in a surreal uh, world that he might be living in. I hope that helped. It did. Thank you so much. Um, I also, and I also Sorry, saw that lower, somebody was asking where in LA is the parasols. Yeah. It is the, um, the Rosa Parks uh, Willowbrook Station, which is in Compton, straight out of Compton. So that <laughs> basically that the community has uh, watts right next to it which is another very interesting history with the Watts Towers and of course the Watts Riots. Um, so the, the, um, the community is traditional, um, uh, very marginalized African-American. And as of late, it's also um, a lot of um, immigrants are coming in. So there's a lot of a Mexican and Central American immigration coming in. So it's a mix now. I can't wait to see those in, installed. I would love to have some in our city too. Let's get on that. Um, I'd love to do something for Miami. Yeah, it would be great. Um, Sean wanted to know, was it difficult getting the studio glass world to accept your mixed media approach? And with so much focus on beauty in the glass world, what was the reaction to your themes? You know, I, I think maybe we, we are on the one side of our glass, the glass movement, not precisely obviously not in the more purest uh, of, of, uh, of medium. So, so in some, some ways, uh, it hasn't been a problem because it's, it's, it's very different than the other stuff. Now, mind you, we're not the only ones doing mixed media with Blangas either. Uh, it, uh, it has, I have to say it hasn't been. It has, uh, the glass world in general has embraced us. Uh, uh, rather openly, and not a problem. Uh, but I mean, I think we have, we have always um, been uh, a little bit on the on the edge because of our our, our use of material. Um, but um, I mean, when we started, it really wasn't that many people um, doing mixed media. And if you go to universities uh, that have glass across the nation, um, the work that they're doing is mixed media. It's really rarely only glass uh, because if they want to have uh, content in the work and not just talk about uh, the the medium 
then they're going to have to, you know, they don't have to, but it's very often that they're using mixed media. So I think it's a lot broader nowadays, it's a lot more accepted. In the beginning, yeah, it was, uh, it was, um, yeah, we were definitely seen as, uh, as, um, as outsiders, and, um, and but we relished that, that, that position. We absolutely cherished uh, the working of hot glass is still our favorite medium. Uh, but I think as a specialization, like any specialization is by nature also limiting. So I think as an artist, you fight that. You intrinsically want to fight that. You want to say, I want to also be free from, from the limitations of, uh, of, the, of its own medium. So uh, mixed media became a natural uh, venue to, for us to say, well, whatever goes that feels right at the moment, why not? And I think in, uh, in universities and art schools, uh, mixed media still not not as it should be at a specialization, just like any other in in the art schools. Thank you. I think that is a perfect answer. Um, I just take one last question, which I think sort of sums it up. Um, Carol Grant says your work is brilliant, um, combining the whimsical motif and subjects, but you juxtapose them with what she says are sort of devilish images. And she wants to know a little bit more behind that intentional juxtaposition. Well, um, I'm gonna, um, I think a lot of people uh, react to the humor in our work. So I'm gonna take that angle a little bit. Um, we do use humor and we do love that. It could be whimsical, it could be harsh sometimes, but we do see it as, a, um, as an angle to, to lure people in. In this day of little screens that are taking up all of our attention, it's very hard to get people to stop and look at art or anything else for that matter. So any any angle you have, I think is fair game. What we what I would say about it though is that with humor, um, it's 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 important not to. We really really don't want it to be a one liner. We don't want it to be a shallow little ha ha moment. Uh, we're hoping that the humor lures you in in order to examine other possible avenues. Indeed, ones that we have not even considered because it's not about what we thought. We get asked a lot about what we thought and when we were making it. And every time you ask us, it'll be a different answer because I don't remember what I thought. I, I don't remember what I'm thinking 10 minutes ago. So I think there's a lot of interpretation is the way it should be. A good way to look at it is, is that we see is this. People have very strong views about music. They, everybody thinks they have good taste in music. It's interesting if you analyze it. And we hope that uh, art eventually gets that way, that people allow themselves to have strong views about art. They don't have, they're not, there's no right or wrong. If you, you know, like something or don't like something, there's no problem. If something, sometimes I like something academically, but not emotionally. So I understand it in history and that's great, but I would, that's not something that would draw me to have it in my house or to even think about for much longer other than its historical position in, in, in the history of art. That's important too. So there's a lot of ways to look and enjoy it, things. But let yourself, you know, let yourself be be right. Uh, you are right in your in your own decision as to what art means to you. That's great. I can't think of a better way to um, end this amazing talk and except to thank you both so much for your amazing presentation and for all of your honest and genuine answers to everyone's questions. Thank you for organizing it. We, we really enjoyed it. And uh, we, we've enjoyed when we have visited the, the, um, the museum and the university and we look forward to, I just saw Jenna saying, ho hopefully when we come out, well, we can't wait to go back out. Yes, and, we do.